if that's okay. Mm. Right, in which case I need to press record. So just to let mm -hmm. you know, everyone, we are recording. Oh no, it's already recording. Thank you, Gareth, for oh, pressing record. Sorry, guys, I, yeah, I forgot to press record last time. Uh, so um, we missed the first bit of the, of the session. Okay, thank you very much for joining us today for part two of Generosity Matters webinar. And these webinars are um, a series of six where we're looking at um, about generosity and giving uh, and how to uh, increase generosity but also how to preach generosity and how can we share stories of generosity in our churches as well. Um, there's, uh, I was just showing before everyone uh, joined, I was just showing that the section for the Generosity Matters webinar is on our website and I'll just share my screen. So all the information you need about the webinars are on the website, go to parish support, finance, and then click on training and development. You'll see all the resources that we've put um, that will help you with generosity and in particular around digital giving advice and support. So these webinars run fortnightly, 12.30 till 3.15 on Thursdays. And the tagline that we're going with is new ways of responding to a generous God. This is about how do we recover from uh, lockdown and um, COVID-19 and how do we ensure that our churches remain financially resilient uh, in future and years to come. We've got a series of six webinars, all the ones we will that have been recorded will be put up on this website on this web page so please go back and check them along with all the resources that we mention in these webinars so if you're taking notes that's fine but you don't need to because all of it will be up on the website later today we are looking at how to preach generosity um, and we've got Mark Brampton, Parish Resources Advisor from uh, the office, who will be leading this session for us all about um, preaching generosity. Before I hand over to Mark, I'm just going to outline how uh, this session works. There is a Zoom webinar chat, um, but if you do have questions, um, please do post them in the Q&A section so if you scroll just move your mouse to the bottom and you will see something say q a if you could pop your questions in the q a because gareth who's from the finance team is monitoring that and will be reading out some questions for for mark to answer at the end of that session or during if we need to so please use the q a for your questions to Mark and uh, keep an eye on the chat because Gareth will also be posting some of the links from that Mark rec uh, mentions in the webinar too. Okay I think we're ready to start. So we have as we did in our previous ones polls to get you started to get us thinking about generosity today so the first question we have is is our offering to the church a priority in our spending or given from what is left over after other concerns are addressed in other words do we give first or is it an afterthought so what do you think feel free to vote and you have a few more minutes to vote. So hopefully you can vote on that. And the second poll. Oh, people are already answering. The second poll is which of these words is most important to our understanding of Christian giving? Is it tithe, giving, sacrifice, generosity or donation? So just be interested in your thoughts on these two questions before we get started. So I'm going to give you another 30 seconds to vote. I can see eight people have voted so far. Thank you very much. I can see the what you probably can't see is the progress bar, which is very, I find this sort of thing very exciting. Okay, one more person to vote. And then we've got everyone who voted. And in case that one person is thinking, I don't want to be identified, it's anonymous. We won't know who it is. Okay. So let's have a little look at the results. If I end this poll 
and share the results. Okay, so now this is an interesting one, isn't it? Is our offering um, a priority or is this something we do as an afterthought? 64% say it's a priority, which is fantastic. And then 36% say it's left over after other concerns. I think that's probably a very honest answer as well for, for, for some people as well. Really glad to see I don't give to church, got 0% few. <laughs> Mark, you must be relieved. <laughs> and uh, our second poll, let's have a look at the answers here. This is a pretty uh, widespread here. Which of these words is most important in our understanding of Christian giving? giving. Tithe gets 18%. Giving is 18%, sacrifice one, uh, 9%, but most people are going with generosity. I think generosity is a really nice word for giving in the church. And 2% say donation, that's really interesting. Mark, before I hand over to you, any reflections on, on, those, on those poll results? I, yeah, I think it is really interesting. I think often the, the tithe is, for some churches, that's centron. For others, it, it, it's just a word that sort of, can be quite controversial. So it's interesting to see that there. I hadn't expected that. Generosity is generally, although it's not the word I was, I was brought up to tithe, even as a boy. So that's very familiar to me. Um, but uh, generosity generally goes down well with people and is what general stewardship officers around uh, England and Wales recommend that we, we think about that phrase. So it's interesting. Yeah, Just fantastic. Right, I think we're ready to hand over to Mark. So Mark, thank you very much for hosting this session. And uh, Mark's going to share his screen and he's going to kick off this session. So thank you again, Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen there, looking at my colleagues to so check that that's okay. Um, we're talking really this morning from about moving from reluctance to joy. This is where we want to go uh, and, and where we are at the moment. I don't know, we, we just talked about some of the words that uh, come up when we think about giving. Um, I want to start with almost a negative. Why, why is it so hard to talk about giving? We're not going to major on this. We're going to talk about why it's a joy. But these are some of the words that, that crop up and people might talk about it. You may have Heard some of these in meetings we've had before. People might feel guilty about money, either they've got money uh, or that they don't give enough. They, they might feel hypocritical or feel other people are being hypocritical. Uh, we may be afraid of offence when we're preaching and teaching. Uh, and I know my colleague from England who, who, who was in charge of stewardship, John Preston, he does a little video. I think later or now we'll have a little uh, a, a, a link to his brief talk about this um, but he talks about when you preach you can preach really well about giving and you still cause offense somehow or you feel you have but it's probably not you and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that um, that there's just a reaction and uncertainty about what the church's line is what the language is what we're supposed to be saying um, uh, can also hold us back but then I, I put let's move uh, to a new mindset I put here, these are the words that I think most of these St. Paul uses about giving and the giving from his churches. He talks about people being cheerful givers. He talks about generous. He talks about being full of grace. And he talks about being eager to give. People eager, wanting to take part in what was going on. And what a transformation that is if our community is in that second half, not in first half we've, we've dealt with some of those things and we're moving forward into a more joyful conversation there were some people with particular readers i think i've shared some of this before and it used to be on the church in wales website i'm just very quickly going to going to step on this slide and move forward use it as a stepping stone what is the church in wales official teaching on giving these very simple things the main text is matthew uh, 6 19 to 21 uh, and that's the one that we always read in Lent uh, in the middle of Lent uh, in, in the beginning of Lent and um, the uh, it's, it's the passage that begins do not lay up treasure on the earth and ends with not being anxious about our own needs and it's that passage that teaching on giving 
the Church in Wales said this is our central text, really, when we think about the giving. And I'm just going to quickly mention these things, not talk about them. We can come back with questions later if people want to explore what does the Church in Wales mean about this? How did that arise, that this is the official view? Um, everything comes from God. We are all stewards. We love people and use things. Money is a key indicator. Money does actually demonstrate where we are, where our allegiance is, where our loyalties are, as Jesus indicated in his teaching. And that's the other reason why you will get a response very often uh, when you preach and teach. And it's not necessarily your fault. It's just what's happening inside people who are listening to us. Church in Wales recognises that we as a church need a programme of re-education. And really, preaching and teaching and what we're talking about now is our attempt to contribute to that re-educating ourselves as we move from one way of thinking about uh, giving uh, to a more biblical discipleship-based. The Church in Wales recommends that all of its members give 5% after tax to their own church. The Church of England adds that another 5% should go to missions, is their recommendation. I'm not going to say any more about that now, but just to state that as the Church in Wales recommendation. And we could come back at the end and talk more about that if you want to. Uh, but that's where, uh, where uh, the Church in Wales sits. And the final phrase, give to God first, always have enough. That uh, with our polls, we're thinking about do we give first or what we've got left. But the Church in Wales teaches what we want to encourage people is if you do give to God first, you find you always have enough. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where we go with that. You would have seen this uh, uh, scripture before. I, I like this. This is one of the scriptures that I find helpful, defines what I mean and what I think we're talking about with stewardship. Uh, and it's where we serve one another with whatever gift each of us has received. We're not just talking about money, we're not just talking about time or talents. We're talking about the earth, our houses, our cars, our lives becoming something that we uh, see as God's grace to us, which is given to us to share with the community around us. So those are just stepping stones. We can come back to them and we can talk more about them at the end if you want to. I want to say be confident because it's good news. The gospel means good news it is good news and if we come out with the clear feeling the clear belief that when we preach and teach about giving it's good news for the people who are hearing us uh, it's good news for them but actually rewards getting something from giving is not theologically wrong it's wrong to give to people hoping to get something back from them that's something completely different uh, that's bribery uh, giving in God's economy is completely different, but it's not without rewards. And a couple of scriptures, Jesus himself in his humanity is described as for the joy set before him endured the cross. He was looking at a reward. And of course, that reward that Jesus was looking for on the other side of the cross was us, his church. And for that joy in his humanity, uh, in that joy, that was set before him, he endured the cross. We can go through a lot if we've got our eyes on something really good. And people will give when we have our eyes uh, on something good. Paul uh, uses this phrase in Philippians to a church that had sent him money. Uh, I, I'm still not totally certain whether the whole letter really is a letter of thanks to people who have just sent him a wonderful gift. But at the end, he talks about the gift and said that... Uh, that he didn't seek the gift, but he was pleased for the fruit that abounded to their account because they'd given to him. Whatever your beliefs or views, Paul believed that the church that had given him something would themselves be blessed by, by God. Easily misused. I'm sure I know you won't misuse that because, um, you know, give to me and it's good for you. Just pass the money over. No, you know, we're not going in that direction we know that uh, but it is good to give i just want to deal with three uh, elements that also 
where we, we learn this, this to be true insights from psychology. Now, psychology fundamentally is simply human beings observing human behavior as God has made us and reflecting on that and trying to understand it. And what uh, one article with a very snappy title, um, uh, it, it, does money make you happy? If money doesn't make you happy, you're not spending it right. That's the snappy title of the psychology article. I think just to get people to read it. I've got the summary uh, if you want to, to, to look at it. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number two point they want to make, if you want money to make you happy, is this. People who use their money to benefit others rather than themselves are more likely to be happy than not happy. So that's the Journal of Consumer Psychology. Issue 21, 2011, psychology is saying giving money makes you happy. Sounds like it's more blessed to give than receive to me. So psychology uh, helps us understand that. With examples of pioneers, I don't know what your reading was growing up or through your, your life, how widely you've read the example of, of the saints and, and modern pioneers. I, I've often read the writings of, of missionaries and people who have given extravagantly and still live very exciting lives. And I, I just point you to one, Amy Carmichael. She was a CMS missionary in India. Uh, she never came home. She went to India, she never came home. She stayed there all of her life serving uh, girls she was rescuing from uh, sex, slave, sex slaves, basically, in the, the uh, 19, early 19, uh, 20th century, 1920, and so on. And she talks in her book, uh, and I, uh, I think Gareth will put up a, a link to a Goodreads review of the book. That, uh, I mean, it's still available. I, I thought they wouldn't be available, uh, but it is available. And um, she, she talks about how giving actually uh, blessed her and how she constantly had more as she gave, and that witness of that uh, we can read about and learn about, that, that uh, reinforces and strengthens us, encourages us in giving. And you may feel those people are, are super people or they're saints or whatever, uh, but they're ordinary people made extraordinary by their obedience to Christ. The witness of tradition. Um, I'm sure those of you who are clergy will have committed to memory uh, all of the homilies of the Church of England and Wales that were written in the, uh, at, the, at the foundation of the Anglican Church. And uh, there's one of those in the second part on giving alms. And it is the most glorious, joyful uh, um, explanation of how it's good to give. It, it, it could be straight out of my, uh, my best wish book, really. So have a look at that. It's in uh, Elizabethan English, of course, uh, but they're available online and you, you can read them. And there's one of the early bishops in the Church of England, as it was at the time, uh, encouraging people to give because it's good to give uh, and a tremendous witness there. How do we, well, first of all, just a quick check. Is there any Questions immediately we want to stop and, and look at. Gareth, is anything coming up that we can quickly deal with? Bigger questions we'll put to the end. Is there anything that's come up? Uh, nothing so far, Mark. No. Nothing so far. Okay, no. good. Good, good. Well, it may not be good. Um, you may have gone and made a cup of tea, but um, changing the conversation. How do we change the conversation? How do we move on? And these are the practical things that I'm encouraging you and us to engage in. Little and often, one of the things John Preston talks about, and I'm not ashamed to just copy that from him because it is what we have learned. Massive study in the United States over four years of all faith groups by a reputable university. This is, this is a proper study available online. Again, Gareth has the link. I think he'll try and put that at some point into the, into the, the chat. And they found that churches that had an, an annual stewardship Sunday or pledge Sunday didn't actually grow in their giving any more than churches that, that didn't. 
do that, that that was something that had helped and it helps them in their discipleship and their thinking and their reflection and meeting together and talking about money, but didn't actually change uh, the giving particularly. They came up with this quite remarkable uh, fact. Among congregations that teach on giving weekly, 90% reported financial growth over the four years. Among those that discussed giving monthly, reported financially growth, 73% of them grew. And in fact, it's not in the report, but I have got a separate uh, uh, I know or have a, a record of how that just goes down in proportion. And they comment on this, say congregations are asking for financial support more often than they're teaching on giving. And so they're clearly saying, make that connection. Don't assume people know what they're expected to do. Little and often, change the conversation, make it something less stressful, something quite normal that we talk about. Uh, as regularly as is appropriate for the lectionary for what we're speaking about. Give a clear call to action. And my colleagues are always prodding me to, to do this. I think some of us uh, may be theoretical thinkers and, and we just talk and expect people to do something. Uh, and people will, but it may not be what you particularly need them to do. And of course, it's up to them. It's absolutely up to them. But if you've got something very clear that you want people to do, then point to it. Just direct them. Once the preaching and teaching, once you're, uh, you come to an end, make a firm, practical suggestion. If, if you want people to give to the church, then talk about Gift Direct. Have the sides person available there at the end to, to help people fill out the forms and get them posted straight off. Um, if it is an offering at that point, say there's an offer opportunity to do this if you uh, have a building fund or a vision project or you are got the Christian Aid Week and you want this to be the best Christian Aid Week ever that the churches have then say that point to it and be clear what you're asking people to do the clear call to action be encouraging be positive people don't respond psychologically well to punishments we don't learn very well the minute there's a threat uh, people's creativity starts to close down tunnel vision comes in and we can't think as clearly when there's a reward and something exciting then we're going to move towards that tell encouraging stories wherever you can uh, about people's giving i think i've got time just quickly to talk about a story that i can in the garrow valley which is a valley uh, in our ministry area. Every year the community brings a group of people from uh, the Chernobyl area that have suffered with cancer, young people, and have recovered and are in recovery, and they just spoil them rotten. And on Facebook, I read one of our wardens, we're like in the Garrow Valley. We don't have much, but we share what we've got. And I can't stop talking about them and commending them and thanking them. And I said to them when I went to speak at the first opportunity to that church, saying, uh, God wants to share what he has with you because that's what he's like. And we don't look at how little we've got. We look at other people who have less. And it's an encouragement to giving, to sharing. It changes the conversation. And keep talking about your vision. Keep talking about where you want people to go. Where do you want to end up? It's very difficult to drive a car when you're looking constantly in the rearview mirror. At what's gone wrong, what didn't work, what people don't do. Uh, of course, you look back, you learn and reflect, but keep talking forward. Money follows the vision. People want to be excited by what you're doing and they will want to give and be, be part of it. So keep, keep that before people. I'm a bit conflicted about this uh, phrase here. We had quite a debate about it because I'm not sure I even want the only in this sentence. We are not only asking people to make a donation, but inviting them to change sides. I, I wonder whether we should say we're not asking people to make a donation. We're, ask, we're inviting them to change sides. But of course, we do want to encourage people to make donations. And visitors particularly will want to do that they want to to be generous back from what they've received changing sides is coming on side with jesus with the good news 
and having our lives changed and being part of changing other people's lives. I hope this is helpful. I just want to very quickly, you don't have to use these at all. I'm not expecting you to. They're just two examples of how I talk about this paradigm change, this change of conversation, change of thinking. Paradigm change, many of you will have heard about it, the, the phrase, um, but it's a, it's a change, a complete change of thinking. And I often think that the word in the Bible for, that the New Testament uses for repentance, metanoia, a massive change of thinking, complete turnaround, is actually a paradigm change. And I suggest to you there's two paradigms, and we're asking people to change from one to the other. I want to suggest there's the pie paradigm, which cash tends to make us think like this. There's not enough. And that big slice has gone on all this other stuff. And if I give you a bigger slice, I've got a small slice. And that's not very good. Uh, but if I give you a small slice and I keep the big slice, that may not be very fair. And it and encourages that kind of very limited uh, mentality about giving. I would suggest Jesus is talking what I call the par uh, potato paradigm, which is a, a joke in, in my family. When I first started trying to do gardening, um, I got some seed potatoes, a bit of wasteland, planted the potatoes, up came the crops and it got blight and they died off. I didn't realize that the potatoes underneath are perfectly good to eat. You can dig them up, they're not effective. It's just a lesser crop. And I came back with a handful of potatoes, which everyone laughed because it was no more than I'd planted in spring. It was a failed harvest. Because the potato paradigm is you plant one potato and there's more come from that. That act of generosity generates something extraordinary in God's economy, in his way of thinking. I first started thinking about this with an old apple tree in my garden in Croydon, with, which was covered in uh, soot from the pollution. And it tried to produce apples, just a couple of apples every year. It was a dying apple tree, but was still producing apples with multiple seeds in. And I just realized you only need one seed to reproduce the apple tree. But the apple tree just keeps on and on producing apples because God has put this generosity at the heart of his creation. Now you can get lost in natural theology, um, but I find that a very helpful analogy to change the paradigm, to change the conversation, to think how God views generosity and what you want, what sort of lives we should be living. The last thing I just want to mention, and then I've got a final slide for reflection, and we can uh, get into some, some questions and, and discussion, hopefully, um, is um, some years ago, I, I saw an advert for BBC series, a podcast by a man called uh, uh, David Graeber, and he's a... Um, an anthropologist from one of the London universities, and did a series for the BBC on debt, which, which sounds very uninteresting. But I beg you to have a look at the link to, I think I've got the right link this time, to the actual one. It's the second one in his series. It's 15 minutes long. Uh, you can get them a whole two-hour series, but uh, this is the one on the theology of debt. And it changed my paradigm. It changed my thinking. And as far as I know, he's not a person of faith, but he's studied people of faith and trying to understand what debt means. And from a theological standpoint, what does debt mean? And that will help change your thinking about giving and about money, particularly, and understand what Jesus is talking about in a different way. So that's just a little resource you could have a look at. If you really like them, like me, you might get his book, which is a massive tone debt the first 5,000 years and uh, explains that we are in the middle of a huge change of the way we engage in, in finance. And if we're going to say something to our community that is practical, but radical, it has to be something about giving and about our attitude to money and credit and debt. I just want to finish with uh, the last slide uh, which really is just almost to meditate, just to have that as the last thing in our thinking. 
back to the beginning. Uh, Paul says, from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I, I, I would argue that when we're calling people to join us in giving and being generous and living generous lives, as an obedience to Christ, that is, um, we are calling us to, to get involved in a stream of God's goodness that comes from him and returns to him uh, and changes our lives. So it's not something miserable. It's moving from something that's difficult to something that's joyful. So little and often, get people used to talking about it and be positive. And uh, this is something good for your congregations to really get hold of and to have their lives changed and change the lives of our communities. I'm going to stop there and see what questions we've got and go back to our panel. Hi Mark, we don't actually have any questions yet. We haven't got any questions? No, nope, neither in the chat or the question and answer. Okay, okay. If anyone's got any questions or any comments that they'd like to share with Mark, feel free to uh, post them in the Q&A or in the chat. Mark, I was really fascinated by some of the things that you've, you've mentioned. <clears throat> in particular, the, the numbers uh, of people who's, uh, or gener churches who's ge who preached regularly about generosity yes, yes, um, yes. and how they saw their giving increase. Now, I've, I know you've mentioned, I think it's St. Asaph have got a very strong sort of giving ethos in their diocese. Is that something that they do? They... Yes, my understanding, uh, yeah, but the, my colleague up there, Tracy White, has been, been in post much longer than me, so she you know, those of you who know Richard Jones, who used to be, they, they work together. Uh, and I believe that the, that the bishop there has majored on talking about that notion of generosity. And my understanding recently, and I think James uh, heard from the other uh, and secretaries, that particularly during lockdown, during the COVID crisis, the, the evidence of a change of culture is there. Of people wanting to be generous with each other rather than constantly frightened of losing what they've got. Because, the, as I understand it, because there's been that consistent, um, not big push, just a consistent natural talking about generosity. It becomes a natural part of the conversation. So yes, that's my, my understanding from Bishop Gregory and yeah. Paul Tracy. Fantastic. I also thought um, what you were saying about behavioural science is is fascinating. I just wonder, does you've you've been trained as a reader, and I know there's quite a few people who are uh, by been through St. Paddens or or some other ministry training. Is is that the kind of stuff we need to now be looking at? Is the behavioural science of the way people give alongside? preaching um from the bible is that is are the two things do they coincide with each other I, I i think they do i think they do um i, I was looking this morning at some uh, uh reference some minister in america who was describing psychology as of the devil and I, I you know you just think really and that's why i actually said it framed it in the way i did that if psychology is doing their proper academic work are observing human behavior as it is and then trying to understand what that's about. And there are lots of things we don't understand. Um, and there should be nothing to be afraid of. So if you look at what I actually just said there, um, although um, there's a certain amount that is still, a, I won't become too controversial, some older psychotherapy ideas that aren't really in currency now, they're still around. People still talk about Freud and so on, which is not really, uh, uh, in current currency. Um, but when you look at those four areas I talked about, I've heard to scripture, I've heard to psychology, which is reason, I've looked at experience, I've looked at tradition, and that's what we are taught, that you apply that to your theological thinking, all of those four domains, in order to um, arrive where you need to be. So yes, I think it, it is something that's in our training. I think it needs to be more in our training. We'll, we'll share that link as well that you you were talking about the, okay. the, yeah. the research as well so we'll make sure we put that up on the website sure, sure. Uh, Mark we do have a question uh, okay. from Ed, Edward LeBron Powell he's asked hello okay. could Mark explain a bit more about what he meant by the church in Wales recognizing that we need a re-education or a complete restart in thinking about giving yes yes my, my understanding of that and I, I'm part of the group that wrote 
those things. Well, I, did, I wasn't here when they were written, so I can go back and, and ask them a bit more about what their thinking was. But it's that notion that as a church, particularly, we've lived on um, money that's been given to us from somewhere else. So we've got reserves, we've got property, uh, they're, they're rich benefactors that have traditionally given to the Anglican Church, which the chapels have never had. And so they've always had a different uh, understanding about giving. And the programme of re-education is recognising we take responsibility far more in the modern world uh, as a disestablished church and a church in a secular society for, for what we're doing. And that we miss this as not as a say about raising money or, or, or fundraising at all, but, uh, but as in fact another praise from some of our teaching material. It's about faith raising, not fundraising. So it, it's about that re-education where we're rethinking and re-approaching familiar scriptures and thinking about how we apply our lives to it. Uh, that, that, that's the way I, I see it, that re-education, that we are responsible and that we, we give uh, as, as part of our discipleship. I love that phrase, faith raising, not fundraising. No, it's good. Is it? I didn't think I didn't come up with that one <laughs> at all. But, uh, <laughs> I think it's it's really good. It, it illustrates that shift of culture, shift, change of conversation that I think we need with our congregations. Mark, just thinking a bit about um, post lockdown and what we've learnt during lockdown in terms of online church and digital ministry. Do you think there is a difference? about preaching uh, in a digital world? Do you think there is a difference about how we preach yes. to people who um, are perhaps more digital aware? Do we need to be doing something different? Yeah, I, I think we do. That, that study I, I refer to in America, although in some ways America is behind us in technology and oddly enough, in other ways ahead. But again, they looked at people who want just naturally wanted to give like text giving and giving on their phones and giving on their phones was was about 60 percent of the uh, not not the total giving but of the new giving people just wanted to do that so uh, i think there's a number of challenges um but also some of the with david graber will talk about for instance some of what's happening is a whole shift of thinking which has been going on for a long time uh with cash which is a temporary you know, we've only been talking about cash for a little while. Um, but money is something that, that's always virtual, really. And I think we need to have a different conversation with people about it. So it's not just, a, I suppose, perhaps I'm, I'm going off the point there a bit, but the key thing is people wanting different means of giving and you need to give them the opportunity. And the preaching and teaching is the motivation. So if you motivate new people, through your online speaking. This is a new audience, you can't see them. They will assume that there is a choice because there is a, there are a, a, a younger or a group of people that just expect there to be a choice on everything. And they will look for the choice. And if there is no choice, they will probably take it as a rejection of their wanting to be involved, I would suggest, or as some failure on our part rather than us trying to be trendy we're not trying to be trendy we're trying to respond to where people are and i'm afraid that just means we need to give more choice about the way people respond uh, whether that's and I've, I've talked to pastors who've got largely student congregations who give on their phone while they're preaching and that's it you know there's no bucket going around so it's an interesting one, that one, Mark, <clears throat> because um, the guidance, I know we talked about this in the previous um, webinar about guidance about handling money is to limit it where, where possible. Um, yes. So digital giving is the easiest way. But the key phrase for me around all of this is it's just about making it easier for yes. people to yes. be generous. It's making it yes. easier for people to hear uh, the gospel, to hear the sermon and want to respond. And yes. all we're doing is is making it easy. So if you don't have that tap to pay sum up machine, it's actually a barrier yes. for giving. And if you don't yes. have uh, something on your website, a giving page on your website, listing all the ways that people can give, you're actually putting a barrier in the way of people responding to a generous God. 
Uh, absolutely. And if, if something's happening in people's hearts at that moment, yeah. they want to do something about it in that moment. We all know when we go back by Wednesday, we're not in that moment and we've lost that moment and they've lost something and we've lost something because that's the time to respond. So I, I, I do think it's about having the means there and making it easy for people. Uh, when I, listen, when I, listening okay. to what they're saying. Really, listening yeah. to what they're saying. When I used to do training, there was always something that you'd try and get the people in the room to, to do that one call to action, that one thing you're asking within 24 hours, because if they don't do it within 24 hours, they're unlikely to do yeah. it so if you're asking people on sunday to give then a couple of recommendations from me would be to have someone on your facebook live for example or even in your youtube comments posting a link to how they can give there and then mm. so those we're all on our phones during services yeah we can yeah. all yeah. text to give in that moment or we could yes. all then click on a link to do it afterwards yeah. so i i've been advising people is to when you're going live and you're posting stuff on a Sunday to make sure you're posting how people can give, whether it's a link yes. to direct yes. giving yes. and sign up that way, which is now online, or you set up a text to give. And mm. quite a few uh, churches I've noticed have been doing that. Gareth Coombs, for example, does mm. this superbly, mm. yeah. always posts yeah. The, yeah. the link to it. So I think it is about just making it easier. And if we're watching online, we've got one of these to hand. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's almost there's no real excuse for for not making it easy to no, respond no, to a generous absolutely. loving God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gareth, have we got any any other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so well, Edward, Edward LeBron Powell said thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone in response to the question you are you answered earlier on. Uh, okay. But Maggie Thorne has asked a question. She says uh, thanks for all this, Mark. I'm now thinking about putting just giving link in our Zoom service PowerPoint. If I do that, would the donation be gift aided? Would the donation be gift aided? Ah, uh, um, it depends. On, say how the how does it collect the money again? Oh, uh, she said she was going to be using Just Giving. So Just giving. yes, oh, right. you can yes. click yeah. on you can. the option, you can. can't you? Yeah, yeah you can. Um, I if, one of the wonderful things about my job, I do give all the different means I can just to see what it looks like and. And uh, Matt keeps saying, claim it back on expenses. But oh! I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously no, he joking, did. everyone. He's joking. You know. No, but I don't do that. No. But no, we, we test these things, see what it looks like. And, uh, and you just feel more confident then. So just giving, I know, gives you the option of gift aiding that. Uh, and also because they take a percentage to pay for the platform. Most of the people, it's the donor that pays for the background work not not you um not the charity uh, but it means you get less so uh they often ask you do you want to increase your gifts so that the full gift goes to the charity and, and many people do that uh, they do that so uh, yes you can and and the the just giving will allow will, will set that up for you and do that but they the way they work it they will claim the tax back and give you the tax less their, their commission their legitimate Cost. Yeah, just giving is is hugely popular as well. So I think using something that is popular means most people are familiar with that platform. So that's yeah. less of a barrier then. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a fantastic thing that you're doing, Maggie, is putting that in your Zoom service PowerPoint. I'd also say because I know you you do post on on Facebook as well, and and perhaps on emails, including it in in your in emails that you send out in your newsletters. I'd look yeah. at every single opportunity you can to make it easier for people to remember how they can give at every touch point. Because mm -hmm. as Mark says, you never know when you're going to feel moved to give. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's why uh, you see adverts that have got that text button. It's why when you go to a service station back in the days when we were allowed to move around, you know, when, yeah. you're, when you're in the toilet, for example, they've got the posters there and then. It's about every opportunity you can think of to, to, to move people to, to give when they can. Any final questions, Gareth, before we, before we close? Uh, no questions currently. Maggie just said thank you for a question uh, for answering her question. Oh, one just, pop, one just popped up in the question and answer. Uh, Pauline Smith has said, when jobs being lost, the future for many is uncertain. How do we talk of joyful giving? 
Yes, yeah, I think this is, I, I've seen so from a couple of uh, parishes saying we're in such difficulty, we, we can't hit people again. And that, that's partly what I'm talking about here, really. Um, you, you have to deal with all these things sensitively, obviously, and know who you're talking to. And we often don't, and particularly when we're speaking online, you don't know who's listening or who's going to pick it up later. So we need to try and think as emotionally intelligent, if you like, again, using the psychology, uh, but it's about sensitivity to people. But the fact is during lockdown, some people have more money and not less and feel guilty about it and feel they want to do something about it. Uh, there are people saying, I normally have two cruises a year. I haven't had one, that money's sitting in the bank. Um, and there are other people who have lost their jobs and just don't know what's going to happen. And we need to help them as well. So, um, but if you go back to that example of the Garrow Valley that says we haven't got much, but we share what we've got. The way I look at it, and you, you may find this helpful or not, but I always think, who are the poor people? This is, this is not, it's an important question. Who, who, who are we talking about? It's people who are not in the room. Or are they in the room with us? Is it us? Is it me? Am I rich or am I poor? And in the scheme of things, anyone on the minimum wage in Britain is in the top 10% in the world of income. So, you know, we, we're all privileged in this country. And that's not to belittle the, the terrible suffering of, you, know, you may have seen me campaigning and getting very agitated about food poverty and children being fed in our food banks with the fifth, fourth, fifth richest nation in the world. You know, I'm not minimizing any of that, but if you think with Jesus was talking about giving to the poor, were the poor not there listening to him? And I would suggest to you that what Jesus is doing is getting everybody to focus on someone with less than themselves, because that's good for us. So it doesn't matter where you are, you look at where other people are and focusing on them and psychologically, that is better for you. Uh, uh, we, we know that. And uh, it seems to me to be an expression of the love of God. That whenever you start to focus on other people, you take your focus off your own depression, your own anxiety, your own fears. And that seems to me what Jesus is talking about in that sermon on Matthew, because it ends with, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Um, so there's a lot we could say about that. We could bounce that backwards and forwards. Otherwise, it's about the privileged giving to the unprivileged. And is that really what we're talking about? No, this is something we're all in together. So I know that doesn't fully answer it because it's still difficult if you've got people who have lost their jobs. But um, and because I've, I've lived a, a life, you know, I've lost my jobs in the past and I know what I'm talking about. I know what that's like. It's horrible. But... Um, um, that, that's, that's, that would be my response. And if anyone um, who's tuning in today has got any advice for Pauline that they'd like to share, feel free to share it yeah. on the chat or, or drop Pauline a line if, if, if you want to. I'd be interested in hearing how other people um, manage those sort of situations as well. Mark, is there any final thoughts from you? If there's one thing we can do now, having listened to you, what would you say it is? Um, I, I, I think really um, reflect back on some of what you've taught in the past, look at the lectionary afresh and look for the opportunities at least to mention that and think whether they're where it's appropriate. Uh, and you don't have to get a crowbar out. And, and do it again, as we just said, do it as soon as possible. If you're anxious about it, uh, you, you don't become less anxious by avoiding the things you're anxious about. I'm less anxious by moving into them. Uh, so, uh, and, and this support each other. So I think just look at lecture, the first opportunity, preferably during this series, have a go, talk about it, see what happens, share it on the chat with people, share it with your colleagues um, about what's worked. So little and often start talking about it, make it begin to feel uh, ordinary. Mark, thank you very much. We've just had one final comment. It was more of a reminder from a colleague to say that anyone who's got a SumUp account can also set up an online donation button. Right. 
um, which I hadn't realized. And there's a video on how you can do it. Uh, there's a transaction fee, but it's lower. And sum up is parish buyings recommended option. So if anyone has got those sum up machines, it's uh, another thing to explore in terms of making it easy to give. They also, I've also noticed as a sidebar, sum, sum up are offering uh, to set up an online shop as well, which I'm dying to do i just need some merchandise <laughs> but then we got all these mugs from uh for a re recyclable mug so maybe i'll set up a shop for that mark that was fantastic really inspiring stuff um everyone to let you know that this will go up online as soon as zoom sends me the link that has been recorded and we'll put it up online along with all the resources that have been mentioned and then on Monday, either myself or Mark will send out an email to you with the link to watch again and with the resources as well. As always, Mark is available, I want to say 24-7, maybe not, mm -hmm. uh, depends when EastEnders is on, to mm -hmm. drop him a line and contact him if you have any questions or if there's any advice or help that you need. Um, We've listened to your feedback as well. So we had a few people saying they wanted to sign into the webinars and law and register, but hadn't been able to do it for every single one. Was there an easy way to do it? Yes, there is. I've now found out that if you log into um, the, the the one webinar like you have today, you are signed up to all the others as well. So we'll be promoting that link. So don't worry about having to rejoin all the time. Um, the link is the same and keep that in your diaries. The next one, well, we're doing a whole series now of webinars and one of the ones in the future we're looking at is um, how to, the different ways that you can give online, but also about storytelling. And we're gonna be inviting some external guests in to talk to us a little bit more about giving um, and how we can be, um, how we can increase generosity through the way we talk about giving. Thank you everyone for attending today and I hope you have a wonderful day and a fantastic weekend and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much.